First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correctional officer, sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correctional officer. Uh... How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Gandrew, host of Tear Talk. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did an episode out of Oklahoma where we were talking about who's running this officer organization called Act, One Voice. Right? And we so mentioned this before. Have been it's a, it's a by an inmate throwing bodily fluid. And the concern was, is where can we go with this? Can we prosecute it? Some states do, some states don't. But my concern was, do officers know how to manage a crime scene? You also touched on something else, actually, uh, managing a crime scene. Uh, a lot of states don't give that type of training to officers. So, you know, having said that, you know, prosecutors are looking for that information. Are we going to actually maybe get some training to help them preserve what evidence they need for the crime? So, are, 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 let's say in Michigan, are those officers trained in how to handle a crime scene? That's the key, because we want these cases to stick. So I went to two of my good friends, Gary York, who has his own channel, Corruption Behind Bars, and Special Agent Curtis Isley. So when we come back from our sponsors, we're gonna go right to their videos, and they're gonna give you some advice on how to preserve a crime scene. Stand by for our sponsors. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. Hello everyone, I'm Gary York. I'm a retired senior prison inspector in the state of Florida, and I also worked with the local sheriff's department. I'm retired now with 28.5 years in prisons and jails and in corrections. And I did 10 years in the military and got out as a staff sergeant for the United States Army prior to my corrections career. I was asked about bodily fluids being thrown on our officers and what are we doing about this horrendous crime and how many of these cases are being prosecuted. Well, I can tell you that in Florida, many, many of the state attorneys in different counties are prosecuting inmates for throwing bodily fluids. In the Florida Constitution, under Section 9, it states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property and has the due process of law. And we could go one step further. The 14th Amendment says we will all be protected when one's life, liberty, or property is threatened. And then if you look at the Fifth Amendment, which tells the federal government no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, or the right to due process. So with that said, let me just go into a quick scenario of protecting a crime scene for uh, bodily fluids thrown on an officer so that hopefully when you have your cases uh, sent to the state attorney and you demand prosecution and that the inmate be charged with battery on a Leo or worse, depending on the inmate's status, he may have a disease that would make the charge even greater. There's many different scenarios, many different situations. But what you want to do is make sure that no one goes into the crime scene area. The officer that has been received the bodily fluids take all of his clothing or her clothing. We want the soiled clothing, very important. Take the clothing and put it in a paper evidence bag, not plastic. The old days of plastic are just about faded out. We want paper bags. This will protect the bodily fluids and things and protect it from heat and protect it from sweating. We also want you to have the inmate removed and placed in a separate area. Just for insurance, we want you to take that inmate's clothing as well. And you say, why? Because that inmate's clothing probably has some of that bodily fluid on it. Then we want you to bag and tag all this clothing from both the assailant and the victim. And we want you to make sure to put the proper time, date, and location. And then we want you to make sure that a chain of custody is kept. So it goes from the receiving officer or the officer receiving the clothing taken from. And then it goes to the next person until it's placed in the evidence locker. And it remains there. With as few signatures as possible, remember, we don't want a lot of signatures on the uh, evidence chain of custody if we can help it. 
and secure it until the state attorney asks for it, and they'll tell you what to do from there. If they're going to prosecute the case, they'll tell you to send it off. We can also swab the um, inmate assailant, get a DNA swab. They have the little packets now in almost every state that I'm aware of. DNA swab the inmate in case he denies that he did it or there is not enough witness testimony. And then we can use the DNA swabbing from the inmate's mouth to compare to the DNA on the soiled clothing if we need to go that far. And folks, if the state attorney doesn't want to go that far, have your management from the prisons and jails tell, have a meeting and say, look, we've got to do something. Our officers need to stop being assaulted by these inmates and we have to show the inmates that we're going to take action and come out with new charges. Uh, take photographs of the crime scene and keep people out. If you have to put a uh, person there to take uh, names of who enters the crime scene, I would do it. Uh, Captain so-and-so arrived on the scene at such such a time. Try to keep everybody away from the area because some of the uh, bodily fluids is going to be on the floor. I'm sure that's not all going to be on the officer. And take the time to photograph all the bodily fluids on the floor get swabbings of the bodily fluids from the floor or get some little clear tubes and if you don't know all this i'm not here to give a evidence collection class but get with your jail detective your prison inspector or your street detectives and and get you some of those vials on how to collect bodily fluids and save those also from the floor get all your witnesses separated and talk to them there are inmates who will talk to you not a lot, but you will get some inmate witnesses from time to time, and that will be helpful in your case. And, of course, any staff member witnesses, get them also. Get their sworn witness statements as quickly as possible. We don't want them to wait for a day or two or three or a week. We want their mind fresh with what they witnessed and get the witness statements as soon as you can. Please, let's all work together to protect our crime scenes when bodily fluids are thrown on officers, and let's get these guys prosecuted. Thank you. I'm Gary York, Corruption Behind Bars. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Curtis Isley. I'm an investigator here in the Midwest, and tonight I was asked by Anthony Ganji to come on and talk a little bit about evidence collection for the purposes of prosecution uh, in, attack, in an attack against a staff member in which the inmate has essentially gassed that person, uh, bodily fluids, um, some sort of DNA concoction generally is what they're going to expel um, onto that staff member. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how I would handle that situation and kind of some policies to, to look at as a guideline. Uh, every facility, every state's going to have their own policy or standard operating procedure as it pertains to that. Um, police academies throughout the nation, I would guess, probably have some pretty similar structure. There's normally a base model that is kind of the case study. It's kind of the most practical um, approach to doing that. So there's going to be a few deviations here and there, but I'll try to, to mainline it and make it as, as plain as I can. So uh, essentially, you know, we'll start from the very beginning and we'll break it down as we go. Essentially, you have two crime scenes. Uh, if you have, we'll do a hypothetical, uh, let's say an officer is on a tier block and they're doing a round and an offender throws an unknown substance, liquid, on the officer. It hits the officer in the face, it hits them in their chest, on their clothes, and that's your crime. Some states have been aggressively charging that, some states have not. Some have made certain exceptions to where this is, this is the crime of expelling bodily fluids and some may be considered a battery or some other sort of person crime. Um, I'd like to see where all states are on the same page with that eventually. But that's our situation. All right, so we have two crime scenes. We have uh, that, off, that staff member's body and their clothes. That's one scene, that the actual body, kind of like a, like a sex crime. You know, you have where it occurred, that scene, as well as the victim, him or herself. So in this case, we have the body and we have the scene surrounding where the incident took place. So the tear block, maybe uh, evidence got on, on the tear floor, or on the wall. And then of course, you got it on the skin contact, potentially uh, your shirt, your hair, things of that nature. In a prison, it's hard, uh, my, my personal opinion, it's kind of hard to, to lock something down for a prolonged period of time, simply because you have a lot of other pressures at hand that involve inmate movement, there's other programs, there's things that are gonna be happening that go 
above and beyond that particular crime scene. So you got to be swift, but you want to make sure it's done right and, and tactfully. You don't want to miss anything. So in this case, obviously, you know, you're going to lock the tear down. Inmates presumably might already be locked down. Um, and this would be a good time to simultaneously have somebody video the situation so we so the jury could see the scene as it lay you know when you made contact on the scene you can see where everything is it's on the staff member you can get a shot of that it's on the wall you can get a shot of that if it's in the inmate's cell maybe he brewed it in the toilet or maybe he had it in a cup um, you want to kind of backtrack and, and see if you can get all these things to the best you can it's going to be hard especially if the inmate's still in the cell make a decision if you want to move them or not depends on your policy sometimes and how you're going to handle that situation but at the very least if you can film that tier film that officer we have a good visual as to what actually transpired it does, doesn't take too much to to see what happened there um, from there medical treatment obviously is a top priority um, especially if the, if the feces or if it's urine it's contaminated uh, the offender has a communicable disease or you know whatever the case may be so you want to address the needs of that staff member um, I've had feces thrown on me before 2009 was the last time it happened to me and that was my main concern as, as the victim of that I wanted to make sure that I was I was cleaned uh, so you want to have medical um, on, you know, on staff to address to the needs of that officer. Whilst doing that, you're in that process, that would be a good time to get that officer's clothes, anything that they're wearing, and bag it up in a paper bag. We do that for DNA evidence because it preserves it. Uh, it kind of hinders cross-contamination as well as plastic has a tendency, especially if there's moisture, to mold and it can compromise your DNA. So you want to make sure that it's in a paper bag and that's protocol as far as I know across the, across the nation. Um, if for some reason the liquid is dried at that point in time, you can utilize a swab. Uh, use filtered distilled water to dampen it. And just like you're collecting blood, it'd be the same situation with other DNA. You could do that, um, you know, if it's, if it's going to be fecal or something to that effect. Um, you could try it dry. You know, you don't really need much. Labs have come a long ways. But, um, you know, I know in blood collection, you dampen it and you can get, you, can, you know, retrieve the blood that way. And then again, you want to use cardboard. That swab can go into a cardboard box. Evidence kits, uh, if your organization is looking at getting some, um, there's all types out there. Um, but the ones that some of them already come with the cardboard boxes, and that's probably the kind that I would go to. Makes it really easy to collect stuff like that. Um, if you have the chance to do it, if you have the time to do it, you know, and you do you do lock down that particular tier or that particular area in the housing pod where it occurred. There's very few people that really need access to that. You know, at this point, the officer should be able to be escorted out by medical. There wouldn't be a reason for EMS or a gurney at this point, unless it's something extremely egregious. Maybe the inmate had broke a light bulb, or you know, did put something else in that liquid to exacerbate that injury and make it far worse than a fluid attack. Um, in which case we have other, another host of issues to attend to. Um, but you can definitely lock it down. There's very few people that need to be in there, and that should be in protocol. You know, your chain of evidence, you want to make sure that, you know, when you show a jury, nothing was compromised. There's not people walking in your crime scene just to look around. You lock it down. The people that need to be there will be there. The people that are collecting that evidence and medical personnel really are the only people that need to be in that crime scene. Because that's what it is. A felony just occurred. And so if someone does have to go in there for some reason, you log it, who they are, when they went in, when they went out, just like you would on patrol in a policing situation. There's a crime scene and maybe a detective comes or a captain or, and they have business to be on the crime scene. It's the same type of situation in the correctional facility. And you log everything that you can. And then it's, it's the chain, chain of evidence. It's custody, custody receipts, evidence receipts. You know, once that, ev once that evidence is collected, you know, the person that collected it needs to fill out uh, an evidence tag for it, saying who they are, their title, their capacity, what the evidence is, as far as they can tell. You're not there to make judgments. You're not there to put, this is blood, you know, because um, at that time, you probably don't know. You might have a good idea, but definitively, you can't prove it at that time. So um, I was always taught to put the descriptor and let the lab confirm what, in fact, it is. And... Um, you're going to put down the time, it, the time it was collected, a description of it, 
And if you pass it on to somebody else, you put down the time that you pass to that person and then they sign for it. And, and that's how you keep, you know, the continuity of that evidence. So when you go, when you go to a jury trial or you present it to a DA for prosecution, they can see at no point in this time, this evidence was not accounted for. The people that needed it had it and they pushed it all the way through until it was submitted. Um, and of course, when the officer has the medical needs addressed, you know, they've been absolved, they've been cleaned, eye wash, tested, uh, the offender has HIV or known HIV or made threats of that, you know, the, the protocols that we initiate medically for that are going to vary um, by state and by policy. But once those needs have been addressed, obviously you're going to want a full statement from that officer and an account of what happened. Uh, if you can get that on audio recorder or video, that would probably be best for, for prosecution. And you already have your pictures and you can get still frame photos from that video that you took earlier. Um, if you have access to video camera, if not, still photos of the crime scene would still work and have a vivid impact on a jury. Uh, without being too long-winded, I think that's all I have as, as a cursory, you know, getting that prepped for uh, prosecution and trying to keep everything, you know, it, it's continuity. You want your evidence to be preserved, not cross-contaminated. You want it to be collected, and you want to make sure that people that are needing to be there are the ones that are documented as being there. That being said, be safe out there and take care. Have a good night. Whoa.